wanted to offer this session for any uh, discussion, particularly, and uh, questions if you have any. But uh, I think sometimes when we're teaching the Dhamma, it's a very uh, one-way sort of street, you know. It can be quite passive. You have a speaker and you have people who listen. And uh, I think as we move into the future with teaching the Dhamma, it's, it's nice to look at different ways to do things and engage people a little bit more. Sometimes people do a bit of group work. We're not going to do that. But, um, but anyway, I've brought my own questions because I think it's very easy for you to ask me for the answers. But I'd also like to learn from you. And uh, sometimes, you know, when we bring up aspects of our own experience, it uh, resonates with other people and enables them to think, oh, yeah, I also have something to reflect on there. Or, yeah, I also have a, a query about this particular aspect of practice that you might not realize. So um, <coughs> this session, I think, is not going to be online or anything like that unless everyone gives their permission. Um, so it's all confidential. Um, but I thought we could talk a bit about uh, ways of applying loving kindness in everyday life and particularly <coughs> through body and speech because I think speech is one of the most difficult probably of all the practices and the precepts. Um, you know, There are so many aspects to it. And uh, I wanted to start by just reading out the Buddha's words on what constitutes right speech and how we should handle things when people speak to us in ways which are not very pleasing and agreeable. Yeah? But uh, basically, this session is for you, so we can, we can discuss this or you can ask questions as you wish. But uh, this is from the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 21, which I forget the name of. It's in there, actually. For anyone who may later want to read it. And it is the Chakachupama Sutta, Kakachupama, which means the simile of the saw. And this is a very famous sutta that the Buddha gave about loving kindness. It's a kind of graded um, practice because it starts off with dealing with people's unpleasant speech and behavior, and then it goes all the way through to the Buddha talking about how to handle um, being, it, it's a bit gruesome, being caught limb for limb with a two-handled saw, a two-handed saw. So one of those ones with teeth that you have to... <laughs> <laughs> it takes quite a long time to get through the limbs. <laughs> and uh, this is given as an example, and I was reflecting on why the Buddha said what he did about it. He basically said that if you're being caught limb from limb with a two-handled saw and you generate any kind of aversion at all, any kind of hatred at all towards those who are torturing you, you're not really practicing his teaching. Yeah? And I don't think the Buddha criticized people in that way to say, you're not practicing properly, you're practicing properly. So I was reflecting on why that might be, and I think it relates to the understanding of karma. And I guess what the Buddha is saying there is that you're not practicing his teachings, which are supposed to lead to peace, happiness, yeah, liberation, because you're actually generating more suffering by having a thought of ill will than by being tortured. Right? That sounds quite hard to grasp. But if you are receiving physical pain or even you know, threats or whatever it is in life, you're not actually generating causes for future suffering simply by receiving that. It's pain and it will pass. But if you're generating your will and aversion and that becomes a grudge in the mind or becomes resentment, then that is going to lead to suffering now and later. So the Buddha was only really interested in two things, suffering and the way out of suffering. So I don't think he was making a judgment there, but he was making a very powerful statement that the impurities of the mind, greed, hatred and delusion, actually lead to more suffering than anything we can experience in this physical world at the physical level. So I think that's worth reflecting on. And it doesn't mean we have to just lie there and allow people to torture us. This is not at all the meaning. But I think it's pointing to the fact that anger hurts us the most before it hurts anyone else. So... Uh, so this is the first part of this sutta, and it talks about modes of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, <coughs> gentle or harsh, for good or harm. That means for benefit or no benefit, really. 
and may be accompanied by thoughts of loving kindness or by inner hate, which could be subtler than inner hate also, loving kindness or maybe some ill will or wish to deceive or, yeah, not really having your best wishes at mind. And then there's a simile about that. And then at the end he says, uh, oh yeah, here we are. So too there are five modes of speech which others may use when they address you. So he repeats that. They may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, for good or for harm, and accompanied by thoughts of loving kindness or inner hate. Now this is how you should train yourselves here in this case. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no bad words. We shall abide friendly and compassionate with thoughts of loving kindness and no inner hate. We shall abide with loving kindness in our hearts extending to that person and we shall dwell extending it to the entire world as our object with our hearts abundant, exalted, measureless in loving kindness without hostility and without ill will. So this is one of the examples of Sending metta first to the people who are actually difficult. <coughs> and here he's not saying we only remain unaffected and utter no bad words, but we'll actually become friendly and compassionate and even generate loving kindness. So this is the way we need to train. It's a training. It's not a given. But uh, I thought that this would make a good subject for discussion because uh, I think speech is an area where, which is very subtle and... Uh, Sometimes difficult, quite difficult to know our motivation. So, uh, yeah. And uh, so that's one thing we could discuss. And the other thing I'd like you to reflect on, and maybe someone can offer a reflection, is uh, the obstacles to loving kindness. Can I become aware, or how can I be aware, of what stifles the loving kindness latent within me? So how do we do that? So would anyone like to offer something? Um, These are just guidelines, but what are the obstacles to loving kindness? What stifles the loving kindness latent within me? Because we all have this seed of loving kindness. I was always reflecting about these other women because I think somehow gender like we already like more like nourishing mm. and a lot of time um, I think it's abused. Yeah. So um, and I found out like a lot of women or my friends, my students, they 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 get to some like abusive relations yeah. or their mom was abused and like violence and all of this. And because they stay because they lost or they lost too much and then Yeah. And actually, when they manage to break up the circle, it's actually because of anger. Mm-hmm. So this okay. is the main point when they mm-hmm. beat, beat mm-hmm. up. So, yeah, I was like wondering, like, how much actually loving kindness, specifically for the women, how much mm-hmm. you know it has to be combined with wisdom, kind of yeah. when we set up yeah. these boundaries or where we yeah. have to take away, yeah, or just by practice, but not really. Do mm-hmm. I don't know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really good point. And I had hoped to talk a little bit about boundaries because what comes to mind straight away when you mention this is I relate to that a lot. And um, I also think that loving kindness has boundaries within it. So I do feel that if it's really loving kindness, it offers a protection. But it has to be loving kindness to all as to ourself. And I think in the situation you describe, and often for me too in my relationships, it tends to be that I think about the other more than I think about myself. And then I end up giving too much to that person. And, I mean, yes, I can blame them afterwards for taking too much from me, but in a way I gave more of myself than maybe was beneficial for me because I forgot my own well-being at that time and almost, like, merged into the other person. And this is actually a lack of emotional boundaries. So emotional boundaries are things which understand that you know at the ultimate level perhaps you can say we're all one although the buddha never actually used those words but actually at the conventional level there are two different people here and we need to be tuned in not only to their needs but into our own needs as well and i think as women we've been conditioned to think about others first which is not really the buddha's teaching 
So in my experience, I mean, I also, like I shared, you know, before I was in a situation with a, a friend who the relationship was unbalanced. I was more in the helper position and she abused me in the end quite violently. And I realized later when I was doing a retreat in Italy, practicing metta, that uh, the metta was really strong at that time. And I felt like there was like almost a force field around me, like a real strong protective energy. And I knew, I just had this gut feeling that it could have never happened had I been in that state. There's no way she could have harmed me. She couldn't have attacked me. I just, I just felt that. I was too centered and too resourced somehow. So then I realized that perhaps it wasn't really metta. When we love too much, is it really, is that really metta? Or is that some clinging and some imbalance there? So that's why it's good sometimes to go through these uh, different categories. And I would say, I mean, although metta towards oneself is sometimes the hardest, it's also the one we most need to develop. Precisely because it's the hardest. There's a lack. There's a lack. We've not been taught to value ourselves. And as women, yeah, I do think we've not been taught to establish particularly healthy boundaries. We, we tend to think things are our fault. This is a very broad generalization. I'm sure there are many men who suffer from this and many women who don't. But on the whole, I would say, we tend to think things are our fault. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I think what the things that came to my mind Yeah. Self-esteem. Something else. But it's about not caring for yourself. Yeah. And we can't love others unless we're happy in ourselves. We can't love we others. We can't really love others unless we're happy yeah. in ourselves. Yeah. So I think to uh, to give ourselves kindness and forgive yeah. ourselves sort of because I went for a long time feeling worthless. Mm. I suppose stress comes when we don't have enough confidence in ourselves. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it's related, isn't it? But I, I would agree with you to a point, and yet at the same time, I think, yeah, developing loving kindness to ourselves is the most important thing. But it's not that we can't love at all until we have loving kindness to ourselves. And I don't think your motivation was entirely wrong. It's just that karma's mixed. And part of it is yeah. goodwill. I mean, part of, I'm sure 70% of it, at least, was the right motivation because it's a wholesome thing to do, right? And you know that. And you want to do good and you want to give, right? And only a little bit of it is feeling that you need to do it because you're not worthy otherwise. That's a small amount. So, again, it's like focusing on the positives and looking at the other parts and saying, okay, how can I just, like... Just give that one a little bit more healing or a little bit more attention. Still looking back at myself with the judgment even now. Right, I'm yeah. Just pointing that out to me. Yeah. Because I'm still saying, oh, I did it because, you know, right. I couldn't prove something. But that wouldn't I have been sustaining every I act. I did. Yeah, but of course. I've forgotten. Yeah. Because, I mean, what you actually do in daily life, like all the acts of kindness, at that point, they're very spontaneous. There's no thought like, now I've got to go and help that person who's just fallen over because of myself. Well, it's not. It's just a human act. You know, it's very spontaneous, beautiful motivation. So the other part's a small part of it, I would say. And I think that with learning to love ourselves, we, we, it's good to start wherever you can. You can start to learn to love another first, or even rather than loving love going towards another, learn to receive the love of another first. Because we learn to love through the love we receive, right? Usually through parents, like they show us how to care, they show us their care, and we learn how to care for ourselves. Not always, but as I was saying with that experiment that was done um, with addicts, you know, and people who'd gone through a lot of trauma, um, they had to have some kind of mirror 
So they created these programs where they'd be valued by the society in society to replace the lack of valuing they had in their families. And this really, really worked to give them a sense of self-worth. So it's okay if it starts from something external and then gradually it starts to yeah, sink in. I mean, it happens to me constantly around my teacher. It's just all the time, drip, 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 drip. It starts to go in, you know? He's like, just let it seep in. Mm-hmm. And you think, yeah, yeah, I'm getting it. But you get it a bit more and more deeply the, closer, the more you're around such people. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Borrow it if you don't have it. <laughs> Fake it. <laughs> Osmosis. Osmosis, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, I was just yeah. wondering because I was thinking <coughs> obstacles. About what, sorry? Obstacles. Yeah. And um, so living in daily life and being aware of all the external kind of outfield and the very un- unjust world. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult not to, not to get the anger, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that balance between... Because <coughs> anger can also yeah. be quite useful <coughs> If it's kind of directed. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a debate it's around that. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a good, it can be quite a good energy for, uh-huh. for change. Uh-huh. I don't know. I don't know either. Some teachers would say absolutely not, and that there's no place in the suttas where it's ever... I think there are no places there where it's ever said that anger in any form is, is of benefit, actually. Mm. But it doesn't say that metta is without passion. Like, passion like <laughs> conviction or or feeling strongly about your beliefs and values, that should be protected and should be fought for, I think. Not fought in a physical way, but, you know, it's not a wishy-washy kind of, oh, yeah, I wish everybody was well, but there's nothing I can do. Mm. That's not really the kind of metta taught in the suttas. It was much more proactive. And the Buddha did emphasize not only the abstinence of unwholesome deeds, but the performance of wholesome deeds. I mean, just the other day, yesterday, I spoke to Ajahn Brahm, and there's been a situation with one of my friends where, where he is in a situation which I feel is, is taking advantage of his vulnerability. And I'd been helping him to try and get some legal advice, actually. Um, and he didn't take it because he said, oh, you know, I just can't do really anything in this situation. And I spoke to Ajahn Brahm and he said, he, tell him he must get some legal advice straight away, you know. And I knew, yeah, I wasn't wrong in fighting that corner because he said, you know, you have to stop abuse. You can't just let people do that. Um, he should he should talk to somebody at least and find out what his rights are, you know. And he pushed me to do to try once more. I said, I've already tried. He said, try again. Tell him, Ajahn Brahm said, you must. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's not afraid to use his sort of moral standing in a way to encourage people to stand up against injustice. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you need anger to do that. Yeah. I mean, from his side, he's not but angry in any way. But you're likely to feel angry. You are likely if to feel being anger. Abused, mm. It's a very natural reaction. Mm, absolutely. I think the question is more, more what you do with it. Yeah, yeah. Whether you yeah, use that yeah. to, as a motivation then to do something, right. to say, yeah, I'm going to do something, I'm going to, rather than mm. I'm then going to, yeah. you know, ruminate on it right, and right, right. engage in fantasies about hating yeah. this awful person, but rather, yeah. okay, it gives you that little shot of overcoming the timidity yes. and what otherwise might be there. Right. And then hopefully it burns itself out and you can. Well. This is the thing, hopefully. If you, if you don't feed it. Yeah. I'm not sure it's wise to take the anger straight into action. Personally, I would wait. I would wait. And you say that that's one way of addressing it, right? You're hoping it will burn out. So you do recognize that it would be good for it to burn out. Yeah. But it, Why not address it first? It's a short-term little burst of something, of energy. Or something. Yeah. But you can get a lot more energy from beautiful states, though. Yeah. I mean, if, if well, you would... If it happens, if you're in a situation happens, where you're yeah. being abused by somebody mm. or... Yeah. boundaries are being mm. pushed and pushed and mm. you know it's, it's hard to you know because otherwise you could end up with a judgment that says I shouldn't be feeling this way right but is there another third option <laughs> is there a third option that's what I'm interested in go <laughs> it's difficult sometimes sorry but you know it's like I work with uh, people sometimes actually anger is something actually I want them to actually experience because mm. it's so passive and they're mm. being abused and they're not actually I agree. I mean, so I don't think we should suppress anger, not yeah. at all. Okay. If we feel anger, it's sometimes healthy to feel it. Okay. But I think it's, for me personally, and as far as I understand the Buddhist teachings, it's wiser to learn to work with that in oneself before acting <coughs> from a place of anger. 
So I would definitely say don't suppress it, not at all. I mean, that's why in the beginning we didn't start with metta straight away. We started with making peace with any emotion or feeling that comes up. And I would also say, like, if things arise during the metta practice, like things that need attention, drop the metta, just drop it and go to that sensation, that emotion, and have a look at it, you know. But most of the time, if it's anger, you'll find that there is an aversive response and there is a wish to get rid of it or to (coughs) rush into action. And they're both reactions to anger. They're not really... um, making peace with anger if you really make peace with anger it does dissipate if you fully allow it it's that old story which is going to bore everybody who knows Ajahn Brahm but it's the anger eating demon story and it is from the suttas <clears throat> and this big angry demon came into the empress's palace so the empress was you know had left her seat and this big horrible angry monster came in and sat on the seat and all the, uh, I don't know, little, what do you call it, subjects of the Empress or whatever were really, you know, disturbed. And my goodness, how can that monster be on her seat? Get off, get off, get out, you know? You don't belong on that seat. And, uh, and then the Empress came back and she said, what are you doing, you know? You need to respond to this with kindness. And so she said, oh, welcome, welcome, monster. Just sit down. Would you like a foot massage? Can I get you some fish and chips if it's my teacher? And, <laughs> and just really, really attending to this monster who actually needed compassion and, and care. And little by little, the more he got, that's why he's anger-eating demon, he, um, he started to shrink, he or she, started to shrink in size and disappear because he just couldn't stand the kindness. <laughs> fed on anger so anger gives us a sense of power sometimes maybe when we feel helplessness and maybe that is a kind of energy we feel might be useful I mean I'm not saying it has no use but I do think that you can get a lot of energy from loving kindness which is purer and even more effective because it's clearer you can see more clearly when the mind's not affected by anger you can see more clearly where to direct your energy and you're not wasting energy on anger it's like you, anger gives you some initially, but it's not sustainable. It will burn you out. Mm. But definitely not suppressing it. No, that's not the way either. It's that balance, isn't it? It's difficult. Mm. Yeah, it is when, difficult. When you engage in the world. And Absolutely. You know, day to day. Yeah. Like a monastic. Kind of Monastics engage a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I always think of myself as not angry because I'm not that angry as a person. But I do have my irritation. So anger has so many different forms you know even if it's just or like I I remember last year I was um, on this retreat with another of my teachers and I'd organized it and by day four I was feeling really down because it was so much hard work and I just wasn't getting any time to meditate and I just realized wow I just need a bit of metta and I just gave myself a bit of metta like oh okay let me just take care of me and the next three days were lovely I could really get into the retreat so yeah Normally I wouldn't recognise that as anger. I would just think, oh, I'm tired or, you know, grumpy or something. But, yeah, a bit of metta really helped. <laughs> mm, I think expectation is quite a big expectation. Yeah. Uh, from our own self or from others uh, mm-hmm. is a key blocker to loving kindness because especially if you've been raised in a strong culture, yeah. you do it more of the external voice rather than the internal voice. Yeah, expectations. It's again a kind of measuring, I suppose. Measuring ourselves against what we think society expects. Yeah. And sometimes those external voices become internalized. Right? I mean, so often when we have a certain way of talking to ourselves, we realize actually that's the voice of my father or my mother or whatever. That's exactly how they talk yeah, to me. So, yeah, it's complicated. But I think, again, the guideline is like, is this causing me suffering or or not? Or is this leading to peace and freedom from suffering? And, I mean, oftentimes, too, we think that other people expect certain things, but they might not do, <laughs> you know? They might not actually care too much at all about what you do. We always think everyone's thinking about us, but they're really not most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, I don't know, I think it's something that comes the more we live in the world and I guess with maturity and also that sort of getting to know ourselves through the practice. 
we have more a sense of um, inner, inner trust and confidence that says, okay, well, this is my truth. This is the way I want to live. And, you know, that makes sense to me. And that can become a gift to the society too because you can explain that. You don't have to be kind of taken in by them and follow them. You can actually teach them something. You, know? you can contribute your truth. I said to my friend the other day, you know, some people might not agree with me the way I live my monastic life, but it's more important for me to live a spiritual life that comes from the heart. That, that's absolutely crucial. Because there are so many different ways that people think nuns should behave. I mean, of course, you have your basic precepts, and that's there. That's a given. But in terms of, you know, how you should move, how you should behave, whether you should... Small things, like shake hands with a man, for example, which I will do if I meet someone who has no idea about the bikini rules and they try to shake my hand. I'm like, ooh, you know, it wouldn't be very nice to kind of recoil from that. So that's fine for me, because that comes from compassion. So... I think that's more important in the end. That's what gives you the sense of self-confidence. But it's an onward journey, isn't it? Yeah. Can I <coughs> I'm not sure how to, yeah, get, how go. to frame the question, but uh, yeah. it's something about the two different kinds of compassion. Uh-huh. Uh, the one that is spontaneous. Yeah. You see a situation and you don't even think about it. You just act. Mm totally selfless and not wanting anything, Mm -hmm. not expecting anything, because you don't know the person and two seconds later Mm -hmm. you're going to be gone and never see them again. And, you know, I do that quite a lot. And yet I have this incredibly self-critical world. I mean, I know we have different parts and different aspects of us. But um, what's the difference between that kind of compassion and metta, you know, the more cultivated kind? Yeah, I think it's like, um, I mean, research nowadays on the brain shows that kindness can be cultivated. It shows that, that people that practice kindness regularly actually have more activity in the area of the brain that governs emotions like compassion and empathy and positive, rewarding emotions. They have more brain activity, and then it starts to become a more and more natural response. So I think we can cultivate it. I mean, we don't just rest on our innate sort of goodness. I mean, that's great, and that is a very human thing, but why not bring that out to the front? Because there's so much else we can criticise ourselves with. We don't want to let the weeds overtake the flowers. <laughs> so I think by practising regularly... Like huh? I like weeds. You like weeds, OK. <laughs> you can have both. <laughs> that's fine, yeah. But there was another um, study done as well which showed uh, the difference between just thinking thoughts, positive thoughts of loving-kindness, and actually getting in contact with the feeling of it. They call it vibes, but I think you can only know what that means when you practice. But there's a a very big difference between actually getting in touch with the emotion and just the words. So the words need to point towards the feeling and should manifest in action, definitely. But uh, I don't really know if that reflects anything you were trying to express, but, but I do think it can be trained... It can be. There are some people who 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 have natural compassion and who who are able to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and 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 be uh, feel empathy and and act on it. And for some others, it's more difficult. Sure. Um, But yet, even those people Mm -hmm. can be extremely critical or self-critical or both. Right. Um, Yeah, it often comes down to this disparity we have between how we treat others and how we treat ourselves, doesn't it? I think for most people, we're much harder on ourselves. Yeah. You could probably just teach self-compassion at every retreat you ever did, and there'd be, you know, plenty of work for people to get on with. <laughs> yeah. Someone had a question. This, you had a question before. Or a comment. Yeah. What I find interesting to observe in myself, talking about self-love, um, I have in, around the people that I know and are in my circle, especially women, because you were talking about yeah. women, is that, <coughs> and, you know, I think I'm quite good at <coughs> saying no when I need to. But, uh, you know, a few people are, are very dear to my heart, so I'm not. So there's two things. Is One is um, how do you know when it's 
fine to say no. Mm. And two is how can you help the people you love with saying no? Because you can give too much and you can yeah. consume yourself. <coughs> and you can become sick by giving so much mm. to other people. So I'm all about self. Yeah. I'm all about being strong so you can take people up with you. Right. Which about a few people that I know. And it really hurt, this is something that really hurt, affects me. They give too much and yeah. there's nothing left to <coughs> So how do you... Yeah. How do you know when it's time to say no, and how can you help people? <coughs> You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at that myself. I don't know, because I tend to go until I'm absolutely exhausted, and then only I stop, which is a little bit too late. All I can say is I try to creep back on that, and I have occasionally said no before I was absolutely exhausted. But it was difficult to do. It was really difficult, and I could see that in the other person they were surprised by that because I would normally never say that but um, yeah one woman helped me to come up with some kind of phrase which echoed this sentiment that you discuss about how we would really like to help others and we need that space and it was something like um, I need to rest or I need to um, stop now or say no because when I'm engaged I like to give my best something like this like I need some time to recuperate for myself because when I am engaged, I like to give my best. So then they see that it's not that you're giving less, it's just you want to give, but more with more quality. It's the quality of the help that's more important than the quantity. Yeah. You know, Ajahn like Brahm talks about Ajahn Chah as well, yeah. how he gave so much that in the end he got burned out. <laughs> so it's, it's, very, it's a bit, for me, I think yeah. it's a very difficult thing. It is difficult. I still think, I mean, because he's not very helpful in that way with me either. Like, he would say take some time for yourself and go and rest now. But at the same time, sometimes he says, don't worry about it, you're making good karma, you know. And sometimes, or sometimes they say, be a doormat, it's okay. <laughs> so it's tricky, you know, it's yeah. tricky to negotiate because sometimes you do feel you want to give everything to a person. But maybe it's just about having more clarity around our motivations for that and, you know, how much is too much. Yeah. Certainly, whenever I feel close to burnout, I do take retreat time. I know that about myself, so I don't think I'm going to burn out. I think I get close, and then I take retreat time, and usually that works. But if it wouldn't work at any point, then I would seriously reassess things. Yeah. So I don't know, really. But I think it's a really important area to experiment with. And maybe it does take just explaining the, the reasons you need to say no. Because yeah. I think it's important to say it kindly not just no, you know. And sometimes when you go too far, it actually does come out a bit rough because you're already a bit irritated yeah. that you've gone too far. <laughs> so, yeah, it's good to say it before it gets to that point. Yeah. <laughs> Someone had a comment over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the I found Yeah. Um, and there's something almost quite um, addictive about self criticism. Yeah. Self loathing, but huh. perhaps it's kind of self inflicted misery, it almost sometimes gives an illusion of, of control. Right. Um, that yes. To let go and, and yeah. to, to truly yeah. be with your, your love as you are. Right. Um, seems seems yeah. seem quite frightening. Yes. Me, Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good question, point, comment. Yeah, I think it's probably quite common because, as I said earlier, even negative emotions give us a sense of self. It's quite a strong sense of self, and it gives you something to think you can work on. You know, oh, I'm like this, so therefore I can do something about it and get to this other thing. And also the idea of just letting go, I sometimes challenge because I think. You can't just let go of one pattern without having another pattern in place as a kind of substitution. You have to have something to let go into mm -hmm. rather than just let go and don't know who I am, don't know where I am. So I think metta does provide that. I think the active cultivation maybe of just doing some practice with self-compassion or you know, metta every day, even if it's just five, ten minutes, however long you've got. I mean, self-compassion is very similar. It's just that you're 
phrases might change a little bit to be more attuned to the suffering in your heart. So may I be free from this suffering or may I learn to hold this suffering with gentleness, something like that, instead of may I be happy. Um, and you just practice with this and it will have a softening effect and give you a sense of being held by something, right? a sense that you care about you. Right? And then it's easier to let go of the more negative habits when we have something to let go into. That's why in meditation, especially with samadhi practice, you know, there's a point where you need to let go of everything. I mean, it happens naturally, but the only way you can really do it is by developing a lot of inner happiness, bliss, I would say. Strong bliss, because at some point the fear will come up really strongly. And if the bliss isn't stronger than the fear, then you'll go with the fear. Right? So it's almost got to be so enticing that it just sucks you in. So I think you need something there to let go into. Yeah. Yeah, and just being kind with those patterns, you know, rather than, oh, those patterns are terrible, they're getting me down. It's, oh, okay, these are the patterns. Let me just see what, what kind of attention is needed here to, to work with this skillfully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Personal disorder, yeah. which they love. Sorry, personality. Personal disorder. Personal. Personal? Yeah. Personality disorder. Sorry. Personality, yeah. It's like mm. a yeah, sort of I mental know. health issue. Yeah. And they lack of empathy because yes. their neural neurons doesn't really connect properly. And um, with the age, they got worse, they are getting worse. And a lot yeah. of time, they are, because they are so associate, disassociated yeah. from yeah. the emotions and <coughs> they can't realize. Yeah. Actually, and if yeah. I, I was trying to help some person like this, okay. and I, I had to give up. Yeah, somehow. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. Th I don't know, I always like thinking, is there any help? <laughs> I don't know. You know, yeah. like, what I know. is the purpose yeah. if this person is, you know, like, yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like yeah, yeah. I mean, the Buddha did say that if, I, if you really can't help a person, the best way to help is just to have compassion for that person, but from a distance, if you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if that person is creating difficulties in the community. or I mean, it happens in monastic life, too, that there'll be people with personality disorders. And you won't see it at first. You know? You'll think, oh, yeah, but they mean well, la, la, la. And then after a while, you realize, actually, there's something really wrong here. There's no empathy. And what more can you do but try to help and you know they have the practices but in the end if it's creating more destruction you have to protect the majority of the people the community so it's very difficult I think I mean I don't think we have to give up on them but sometimes we are not the person anymore to help they need maybe professional help yeah like in the case of my friend you know I'm not saying she has personality disorder or whatever but one really helpful um, teaching I had there was to love the tiger at a distance mm -hmm. It meant I could still have metta and compassion, but I didn't have to be in contact with that person because that was just too difficult for me. It wasn't helpful. And there's no need also. I mean, now I feel like completely at peace with that person, but there's no need for me to be the one to help or even <coughs> think I've got the right to help or that she needs help, you know. It's, um, it's not my business. Yeah. Are there people staying in the monastery then or like... Because they cause like problems. Uh, it depends. Really it depends. Yeah. It's sometimes very difficult to see where the issues are, like because they will say things that maybe distort the truth quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So people don't always know who to support. Some. It's very rare, but it happens. It does happen. I'm sure in any society, whether it's a workplace or a monastery, or yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know what creates it, but. Uh, <coughs> We can still have compassion for them, even if it doesn't <coughs> help them. You know, another important thing about metta is not to practice to change someone, mm -hmm. because then it's not really unconditional. It's it's practicing in order to help or in order to change or to bring about some kind of effect. The idea is to practice to transform our heart, mm -hmm. and the more we do that, the clearer it is to see how we can help others. I think, but also to help where you can help and not where you can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We 
we finish at five today, don't we? So well, maybe. Uh, what do people want? Who would like to have ten more minutes of Q and A? All right, we'll do that then, and then we'll have half an hour, forty minutes meditation to end. Yeah, mm -hmm. does that sound good? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just um, wondering about the example you gave when you were on retreat in the monastery and said to be at the back of the queue. Uh -huh. And what you described working with your mind sounded very creative. Um, I just wondered what uh, what, <coughs> what things kind of like create on you more in like everyday life. Like when we're on retreat, we can often yeah. have really creative responses, okay. particularly around patriarchy or yeah. rules or uh -huh. just wondering you had an example particularly from inside the spiritual community where things are difficult say and um, so I know my own experience is like uh, yeah feeling like everything is possible often when I'm on the tree or particularly yeah. creative yeah. frame of mind you know meta is sort of available <laughs> right. but then the, the daily yeah. sort of uh, relational yeah. often yeah. it can feel like um, we're not necessarily at our best, and um, right, right. at a certain yeah. point you have to sort of say, enough's enough, or yeah, yeah, yeah. you had examples yeah. of that, particularly from the spiritual mm. That's a really interesting question. Nothing comes to mind as such, but I think my general approach in day-to-day -to -day life is just to look for tiny opportunities to do little acts of kindness. It sounds really clichéd. But um, I just look for every opportunity to do something, <laughs> whatever it is, like open a door for somebody, smile at someone on the tube, pour a cup of tea, surprise them by not doing... You know, because as a monastic, you sort of looked after, and I sometimes like to say, hey, let me do that. <laughs> you know, let me make the tea or whatever. Um, looking for little things like that, but also I would say that in the retreat, I was working more with my mental state around it, but after the retreat, and actually even during it, I did something more active, proactive, <coughs> which was to write a letter about it. Um and to speak with my teacher about it, to sort of plant a few seeds to move on. But I think what I'm learning there also is that it has to be the right time, and if we just forge ahead and try to make big changes at once, it never works. So it's really about tuning up with that person and seeing what kind of mood they're in too, because everyone's in daily life and everyone's busy, you know, and they're not always in the right receptive mood. So I asked him towards the end of the retreat, you know, whether he'd really taken that on. And he said, yes, but when you talked to me, I wasn't in the right frame of mind, but I'm thinking about it. And since then, there have been discussions around that. So I would say, like, because everybody's busy, not only me, like, listening much more to the situation, finding the right time mm -hmm. when someone's not busy or stressed, when someone's not in public, for example, you know, not to cause them embarrassment or shame or feeling put on the spot, you know, and giving a lot of time, being patient. Um, so that's the timely, untimely thing. And yeah, finding out, I think, uh, focusing on the things that are really important <coughs> rather than any old thing to sort of take issue with or try and change, but focusing on what really matters. And it's great with my teacher, I'm talking about this example just because you brought that up in the reins, but, um... I've noticed that it's really helpful to... Like, he'll respond much better if it's something that's genuinely an issue that would pertain to whether somebody may progress on the path or not, rather than just, oh, the toilet should be cleaner, or, you know, something really basic, really sort of, it's neither here nor there. So kind of choosing your battles in a way. I don't like the word battle, but <laughs> choosing your causes. I was going to say, because I've been brought up to the same the Yeah, yeah. I think that also that means he's split somehow or yes. fallen out. Yes, that's what, um, yeah, and even within his own community, you know, it's not easy for him to just say, right, now we have total equity all around the board because he has to wait for the whole community to come on board with that and find a way to do it that's very sensitive and that's going to, you know, when people are ready, because I think some people in that community are more ready than others to make changes. The ties are very... Uh, resistant to change I would say on the whole I mean that's a generalization of course and there's some Thai women who really su are very strong supporters of bikinis but on the whole they have a very fixed idea of you know the sangha meaning male monks 
<laughs> and it's, uh, it's sometimes too confronting to suddenly expect them to not only accept bikinis, but then put them in order of seniority in the queue as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. One aspect of gentleness that I'm, I'm starting to learn more about, I never really thought of this before, but one aspect of being gentle is also being patient which I think is interesting for me personally, because when I look at the thing about, you know, compassion, gentleness, and letting go, I think the compassion is quite strong, the letting go is getting there. And I'm thinking, how can I, is it gentleness then? Because I'm quite gentle. And then I realize, ah, it's the impatience side of the gentleness. I'm not the most patient person. <laughs> so, yeah, I think patience is something I, I would like to bring forth much more. Uh, this lady first, and then you. You mentioned that metta is not about just the thought, right? But it's about also pointing towards the feeling. Yeah. And I, I see that in my practice, often I struggle with that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like sometimes it's more an intellectual thing <coughs> than me, you know, saying yeah. those phrases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't feel it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 I was wondering how to cultivate yeah. really the feeling which I think perhaps is the core yeah, of yeah, the yeah. I think just carry on practicing. I mean, there's certainly nothing wrong if you're not feeling it. Mm. But it's not that anything's wrong at all. It's just that as it deepens, it manifests more as a physical feeling. I mean, sometimes it might be just harder for people who maybe aren't as much in touch with their body. Some people are more intellectual than somatic. Mm. You know, some people are more visual. Mm. It's just a different you know, sense that's developed. So it doesn't really matter too much. The most important thing is the intention, definitely. And at that time, your mind's purified temporarily from unwholesome thoughts. So I would say just listen in a little bit more, say, between the phrases. So there's a gap there. So have the attention <coughs> on the body at that point, whether it, wherever you feel sensations in the body. Have your attention there and just notice the response. You're not looking for anything special. You're just looking for some feeling in the body, that's all. And as you get more sensitive to that, you'll start to see that it does change slowly throughout the meditation. Even if it's just a little bit, like you notice at the beginning of the meditation, the body's a bit uncomfortable or a bit tense, and at the end, how does it feel? It feels a bit more relaxed. So that is the effect of the metta. Yeah? However subtle. So don't overlook the subtleties. Yeah, yeah. I had one experience in Perth where I was um, doing Anapana, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm sort of peaceful, nothing much, you know, nothing much is happening. Then I remember the instruction to notice delight. You know, sometimes these words stick in your head, notice delight. So I just looked at it a bit more closely, and suddenly it became absolutely full of bliss. And honestly, there was nothing much there before. It was just this slight shift in my mind and also in my um, idea of what I was looking for. I thought it would be something very gross and very obvious, but it was actually very subtle, and it just took my attention to become a bit more refined to notice it. So I think it is there. I think it just takes... It's like the, with the phrases, you're like teasing it out, you know, like just teasing it out. But don't worry either way, because it, it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one more <coughs> question. <laughs> I mean, you talked about um, when you were in Italy... Oh, yeah. Cultivating this method, and you said you felt it was offering you almost like a protection. Yeah. yeah. And you said, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. Because, you know, the Buddha is it, he talks about these 11 results that one can expect from cultivating metta. Yes. And of course, it's having ice dreams, waking yes. up happy, but he also talks about the protection yes. it yes. confers. And uh, he also mentions uh, Majima Nikaya. Buddha, even if you're being sword limb from limb, yeah. and it sounds really fantastic, you know, I agree, but actually what I find really inspiring are these accounts of uh, the, the bhikkhunis and bhikkhunis in Tibet, mm. and some of you know, the terrible um, the torture, actually, that they've undergone, That's true. and for some of them, you know, to emerge from that yeah. with a heart that's still full of love. I feel no, there's no hatred towards my torturers, my challenges. It's just yeah. compassion, yeah. recognizing, yeah. 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 you know, terrible karma they, they could be. <laughs> right. still, you know, having that 
that love. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, yeah. it's just to come back. It's that, it's that protection, isn't it, for mm. ourselves? Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It is protective. Mm. And I think a big part of what you just reflected too is the compassion they feel. You know, the way that compassion can overcome anger because in that case there's nothing they can do to change the torturer. Nothing. And the Buddha says, you know, if everything else has failed, like you've tried the metta, you've tried the kind words and all the rest, then you just have to have compassion for the person. And I think the more you understand your own mind, the easier it is to have compassion for someone perpetrating those acts because you know that it's not possible to perpetrate in such a way unless you're really either suffering knowingly or very, very closed and cold and disassociated from your own heart, you know. Something in you's had to die or you've had to cut off from your basic humanity and how painful that is, you know. I think it's much more painful to cut off from love and connection than it is to suffer, actually, you know, than it is to, say, suffer physically or emotionally, you know, with feelings of maybe fear or vulnerability. That is preferable to feeling closed down, definitely. So, yeah, I, I think they must be developing a lot of compassion there. But it is, it is amazing, and it's great that you brought that example up because uh, it's something real that's, that's happening, that has been happening in the recent past. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we, none of us have to go through that, but I guess sometimes when your back's against the wall, you don't know what you're capable of. Yeah. So stop practicing now, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you very much. It's really lovely to hear these reflections. And yeah. Just look a bit closer at Meta and all its various aspects. <coughs> yeah.